Hey, 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 my name is Polish Links and welcome to Merit. Well, I would say the rest of the title if I remembered it like in the last episode, which when I surprisingly remembered it, but I don't, I don't. They're called sometime something something. Anyway, the next morning Anton got ready for work, overcome by the belated sense of relief. Everything was alright. Things turned out fine. No one had wandered off into the forest. All is well that ends well. Or something like that. His neighbors too seemed to be in a good mood. Everyone he met in the corridor or outside the hostel in the courtyard smiled and wished him good morning. Apparently, the mere fact he'd taken part in the search the other day meant he'd become closer to the long term inhabitants of the campus. But Anton still couldn't stop thinking about Nancy and her strange departure. Really strange. Really, really, really strange. <laughs> Alright, that's nasty. Anyway, he'd been much the same, right? That night he fled to the forest rather than join the poetry reading. Maybe she also felt that unbearable bitterness. And you know, she felt she simply couldn't stay any longer. Perhaps that was what Steva meant when he said the town didn't accept her. Oh I guess that might have made sense. Although that sounded more then a little hypocri hypocritical. The town itself didn't accept her. Pretty cold. So nobody who wait, but she was there for quite some time. Well, quite some time already, right? It's not like she was there for. I don't know a day, two, maybe five. She had like it was mentioned a month to the end of the contract. Or something like that. So, ah, whatever. So, nobody who lived on campus had anything to go to do with whether a newcomer fit in. Perhaps if someone actually reached out to support the new arrivals, then they wouldn't have the problems. But this was probably one of their unspoken rules: no helping hands for anybody. Just leave them to sink or swim. Some people still believed in that sort of thing. Throw some on the water and wait to see if they make it out by themselves. Uh, I like the idea because that would be, I, I guess, good for me if I were in this situation. Because, well, I don't necessarily like getting help, at least getting help without asking for that. Uh, but then again, some people actually need that help and they are. Still, like they knew, but they, they are not able to ask for it. So, uh, whatever. Then again, everyone was nice to white, weren't they? Huh. That's kinda true. Anton included. No, that was anything out of the ordinary. White was forever up. Beat and never looked as surly as Anton. White paid attention. You could see it in his eyes. That was a rare thing. Someone who'd actually listen to you. At the same time, he never seemed to actually meet anyone's gaze, which always struck Anton as strangely impolite. Almost defiant. Maybe White really was everyone's friend, but Anton couldn't shake his doubts. He didn't have much practice taking people at face value. He couldn't just take it on trust, the other man really did value their conversations so much that he always won't talk when Anton himself was usually intent on keeping his distance. <gasps> <sighs> but he's a new arrival too, Anton thought. What if he needs a helping hand? What if he's just as lonely as anyone else? He certainly didn't look it. Quite the opposite. White was always cheery, ready to make small talk with anyone. He was hard life and soul of the party, but he looked as if he belonged there. Anton not so much. Or well, was that actually true? Was there anyone living on the campus who typically spoke out of turn around Anton or behaved untowardly? Green came out with bizarre non sequiturs or was sometimes downright rude, but he was strange to begin with. 
It was just his sense of humor talking in that, if that. Sasha and Veronica were always neighborly and unfailingly polite. A little distant, maybe, but then they enjoyed each other's company and Natal didn't cross paths with them and that often. Steve was always at work and, well, checking in with the new arrival wasn't part of his job description. All in all, surely it was just Anton's worldview. <sighs> Clouding the truth right from the very beginning. You're 20 years old, huh? Stop being so dramatic. Work the days trunk antennas unbearably long. Only on that day? Seems like every day to me. Uh, in my case. He felt distracted, made repeated mistakes and earned a short but vitriolic rebuke from Misha in the process. Eh, that rarely happens with me. When evening finally arrived, he felt as if someone had juiced him. Like Lemon, it was a few hours until dinner, perhaps he needed a rest in his room. Go home! Take a walk! Can I save the game? Yes, I can! Hmm, whoa. Alright, that's a lot of text that... Telling me... That's not really easy to read, if you ask me. Anyway, uh... Let's just take a walk. He could do with a nap, but something told Anton that he'd be better off researching the last place smart on the map before it grew dark. He was down to two. The first, a leg somewhere beyond the forest. Okay, he wasn't going there. The second was right over the moon cafe. That was far, wasn't far. And he already knew the way. Anton took the diary out of his bag and glanced again the cover. Should he just ask Siva who it was that used to live in his room? That would be a lot easier. Why go? To this much trouble because it's less boring that way then again it was definitely more interesting going about things this way no it's just less boring and turn how uh, how has your job been treating you none too kindly to be honest so you are keeping your diary a handsome volume not quite Anton said absently then added it's not mine anyway. I see. Was this kind of the kind of thing he ought to just confess? Anton was entirely sure, and yet he found himself slaying the floorboards, the missing sheets of paper, and the mysterious map. So no way to find the last of these crosses. Might I take a long? This wasn't the first time White had forced his way in the picture, perhaps he really was feeling lonely. Either that or he honestly thought Anton made for fascinating company. Why not? But I'd like to get there before it's dark. White flipped Illy through the diary while they walked, poring over the remaining pages. Once or twice he laughed out loud as if drawing some conclusion that amused him. Penny for your thoughts? Well, it's all these dates are quite recent, up until yesterday. Is this someone's idea of a joke? Like who? You think I wrote it? Prank you, maybe. I did wonder, White said, unperturbed. But I raised the issue in the first place. You could hardly have guaranteed I'd take the bait, and well, you don't seem the type. Whatever breed of madman would actually produce something like this for a practical joke? Now, the logical conclusion would have to be that someone entered the room and planted it. I don't have even considered that option. Still, why not? It seemed logical, and yet if someone had really left him half time to die, pointing towards all sheets of paper scattered across merit, then why? Who would want to do any such thing? Right. Here's another crazy idea for you. I believe Anton is not uh, on living on having his room uh, on the ground floor, right? I think he has to go upstairs. So what if there is a room downstairs and someone from downstairs hides uh, hides that dire of his or hers? Well. Not necessarily on the roof, but let's say, let's call it a roof for their room, right? Does make sense? I mean, I wouldn't say roof if I knew how it's called, but... Wait, I know how it's called. So, does make any sense? 
The guy is writing a diary. He's living above. Wait, actually, it was said. I don't even remember. Whatever, the seller, right? Uh, I just remembered. God damn it! How did I forget that? Whatever. What? No. Okay. Anyway. Uh, who else has the keys to our rooms other than Steve? I mean, I have no idea. It's probably just him. Huh. I guess. But no, definitely not him. You say so. Why seem to rather less confident? Could it be Steve? Surely not. Seriously, Anton thought it could have been anyone. Who's to say they locked the room after the last tenant left? Maybe it was this Andre after all. Whoever it was for, perhaps they weren't the madman, but they had to be pretty strange. The familiar Bohemian eastern looking building that was the Wood Cafe came into sight. The two of them walked all the way around it, but neither found anything. Then White saw it, a fluttering piece of paper tied to a nearby tree branch. Why this movie? Is the lag all years? The film is completely new. It has to be a joke. White said, shaking his head. I guess hiding there was one thing, but these pages, how could anyone guarantee you would find them? Before they were carried off by the wind, I mean. They made their way back to the campus, both suggesting various assumptions about the perpetrator. When they returned, the courtyard was in chaos. There you are. Hey, what's going on? Getting ready for Kupata, Kupala night. Starts over there, signing people up. If you want help out, go talk to him. So, it's he this big deal? Big a deal? Anton couldn't think of another place that still celebrated this old pagan holiday. Oh, sure, well, it's gonna be crowd every year. People from the campus and locals, so we want to do it right. The people who come here for the summer is the only holiday they get, you know. Doesn't care to give them a good impression. Siva seemed affable enough, but strangely distant, his mind elsewhere. Anton wandered off to try and find Sasha in the crowd, but had no luck. Then he noticed him a little way off, with green Diana under the porch. Hey, Steve, told me I should talk to you. I mean, hey, Steve told me I should talk to you. There he is now. We're trying to work out to get the straw for a scarecrow. Where to steal? Green corrected him. Says who? We can. Well, ask. We know it's tradition. It is, is it indeed? Your tradition may be. Where would we still drop exactly? Uncle Igor's. Green said instantly. Not a chance. Diana shook her head. Not on your life. How about the old ladies near the main entrance? They never notice. Isn't it safer? Safer? We still weep. Green objected. The risk is the whole point. Getting the blood pumping. Who's this Uncle Igor? Igor, whatever. Hanto interjected. A dark sorcerer! Green said in a somber tone of voice. A mean old man who'd skin off the life he called us on his property with a vicious dog, too. Which sounds like the more appropriate choice. Right, and what do we need? A lookout to keep watch. Someone to drag Uncle Igor from the street and someone else to actually get the straw. So who's with me? Oh, very well, if you insist. And then? Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. Save the game. Listen here. No. No. Sure, I guess. Seems like fun. No, it's not. Why did I choose that option? Maybe because I don't care. They walk together deep into merit, still discussing the plan. Is it far then? Quite the way, yeah, he lives right out on the edge of trust, near the entrance. It's a weird place. The bricks are all black with soot. They say this house went up in flames once. He's one of the people who saw the village that stood here before. So, how old is he exactly? A hundred easily. Green stared at Anton, bug eyed. No, seriously. In his seventies, I think, but it's hard to tell. With that bird, he's got. They made this uh, Igor, Igor, Igor probably, sounds more like a Russian, because it also sounds the same in Polish, so it wouldn't make more sense, 
Anyway, sounds like the devil in the flesh. Anto was ever already having second thoughts uh, about the choice that was made by me. But then again, he told himself only one way to find out. By the time they finally reached the street in question, he'd been out of breath for a while. There it is, the house over there. Quietly now, huh? He can see quite a bit from the windows. We probably ought to hide just around the corner of the neighbor's place. Nothing like some oranges. Advance a little at a time, the four of them converged on the meeting point. From there, they could see into Igor, Igor's courtyard. All that stood in the way was a low fence, no barrier at all. Okay, let's do this. Who's getting the straw? Anton, you feel like risking your life for the cause, huh? Stop, 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 stop. Sasha objected. We're not here to give the Eurovel a baptism on fire until you keep an eye on the door. And I'm not sending a woman to combat. Diana, you watch the windows. Green, you're with me. Come on, get moving. Tell them we died bravely. Huh. The two of them moved in a crouch towards the fence. Diana stared pointedly at Anton, then hurried to the other side of the road, where she could see the windows from a distance. And Anton, he stared at the door, waiting for it to open. There was a loud crash from the yard. Anton risked a glance and saw Sasha's legs disappearing behind the fence. In silence, Anton stiffened after a disturbance like that. Surely their cover was blown. And yet nothing happened. Five minutes went past. Ten, sa still silence. I see him! Diana screamed abruptly. He seen you! Run, run! She fled towards the forest. A voice, Uncle Igor, presently boomed across the street. Hey, aren't we fearless, eh? A shot rang out. Sasha and Green emerged from behind the fence, both clutching the sheaf of faded straw. Igor's dog was barking furiously. Red Anton! Sasha yelled. Anton turned and ran, not even thinking about where he was going. Another shot rang out behind him. His heart was beating so loudly it seemed to drown out everything else. At the first turning he could see, he made right and ducked behind someone's shed. He couldn't hear the dog. Everything was quiet. There was no same Sasha Green on there. However, Anton made his way back to the campus. After all, the others would be doing the same. If they didn't end up hopelessly lost, of course, neither Sasha nor Green had followed him. Anton, you made it? Anton then saw the two men. Sasha looked as if he'd taken tumble, but he was still holding the straw. I thought he might have got you. Well, he cries, I never thought he'd start shooting. Oh, he just fired in the air. Sasha smiled. Still, we pretty much panicked. If it wasn't for Diana, he probably would have caught us. No, no, the brain's out. Where is she anyway? Diana? I saw her heading for the forest. I think she took the long way around. You're sure she's okay? Pretty sure Uncle Igor never even came downstairs. What if he did this time? Anton took a piece of the straw from Sasha and from Green that tired but later they trudged onwards to campus. They were greeted like conquering heroes by the woman making refs and Diana, who got there ahead of them. Save and sound, such a little adventure with several more dramatic flourishes, including a vivid description of in Uncle Igor springing out of the house with his gun in his hands. And all about a liquid courage. Green added when the other man was finished. Okay, then girls, back to work. Give me a minute. Anton, why did you spoke up when he said Garros? Whatever, Anton said absently. He could still sense the there in the inside of the pocket of his jacket. He didn't want the distraction dragging him down. Okay, if you're quick, it's all ready to kick off. Oh, don't worry about me, I'll be down in a bit. Anton made his way back to his room and sat down in the bed. He wasn't sure he wanted to attend the party. He still hadn't made up his mind. He could still remember the awkwardness he'd felt watching the pot ringing, but then... A great deal had changed since then. He wasn't alone, for one thing. For there was also the strange sense of foreboding at the idea of adding the holiday festivities. Of course, it was ridiculous to put any wave in that sort of vague premonition. He was smarter than that, wasn't he? But why go if he really didn't want to? But he did want to, surely. He'd been looking forward to just to it just this morning. Okay, just ask me if he goes or not. And he could imagine it all to easily, sulking home. 
much later. Remembering how he'd spent all this time in Mart and skipped the most important day of the summer to sit in his room alone, whether or not he really wanted to, surely it was better to just go. Anto stared out of his window. Lydia Green and Diana had left, but Veronica and Sasha were still down there. What followed played out like a sign film. Anto saw Veronica shaking her head. Sasha took her hands. Veronica stepped back and pulled away. Then she turned around for the house, while Sasha stood in the middle of the courtyard. He looked after her, unmoving for some time, then kicked out firstly at the nearest bunch. Was that an argument? And he turned on, had thought the two of them were all sunshine rainbows, but then he thought the grass is always greener, right? He put the diary into the drawer beneath the table, then slipped out into the yard. As he walked through the forest towards the river, the darkness grew steadily, thicker and colder. From down the riverbank, Anton heard shouts, the crackle of a bonfire and the melody from someone's guitar. He felt a sense of wave, like his first day here in Mert. Everything this was the start of something. Huh. There were people on the riverbank than Anton... More people than on the riverbank than Anton had expected. Some distance away, they were dancing to the music from a battered tape recorder. They saw girls he didn't recognize. Locals who never visited the campus. They pushed refs out into the river. Dozens of them, all stuck with candles that trembled as they drifted across the water. Further still along the bank, close to the forest, there were more of the locals in a noisy crowd. Still was lying, it seemed. Plenty of people had turned up just for this particular holiday. He spotted some familiar faces and wandered over. Several people he knew were down by the water's edge, clustered around someone sitting on a log. Anton squeezed through the crowd and realized this was Sun. Redhead was holding guitar, smiling happy. He threw Anton a V. Victory. Two fingers raised, palm forward. What should I kick up with? That was one of the classics! Some Beatles, I guess. He gently lifted the guitar and launched it straight into Norwegian wood. Several of the onlookers began singing along. Anton, Anna, and several of the locals in the crowd, even Taro. Sam finished his first song and quickly segued into another. He was still taking shouted requests, none of which had stumped him yet. The crowd was growing larger, Anton was gradually forced away from the water. He retreated further, not wanting to be trampled underfoot. Down by the fire, he saw a local girl drunkly squealing, slapping at the hem of her skirt, where it had caught light. Oh, her man snatched her up body, carried her to the river, pitched her in, then jumped straight after her. <laughs> the pair of them were laughing, splashing through the water, sweeping the refs aside. He had high spirits indeed. Hey! He heard a familiar voice. Lily appeared out of the crowd and reached out to set a ref on Anton's head. He promptly slipped down over his eyes. Well, there is a sore face. Speak for yourself, Anton said and adjusted the ref. Oh, I'm always like this. Always. He smiled. That does sound like you. You want to drink? Green brought a fresh crate of beer. It seems a bit cold for beer. Then you have the fire, you can make it warm. Warm beer is pr pretty decent as well. Jump over the fire, that will warm you up. Or you can do this. Have you tried it? I don't know, it's up fully. <laughs> you honestly think I would? Don't hold your breath, okay? Have fun now. Hey, come, come, come back here. She's like the best. She vanished in the crowd. Why, Anton, why are you not in love with her, damn it? Anton wondered how exactly he was supposed to have fun. There certainly seemed to be a lot of it around. He heard a guitar on the other side of the farm, with someone singing, and realized with a star that it was Steva. I'm, I'm so excited, I can't wait to meet you there, but I don't care! Anton squeezed through the crash for a better place to listen. Steva was singing on a log, with a crowd of onlookers around him. Lily among them. She seemed hypnotized by the sight of his fingers dancing across the strings. 
I light my candles in the days because I found God. That wasn't a good line. He tried in silence and sat there, unsmiling, listening to the ripple of a pause. Okay, one more. A little song about Copernicus. Shiva! And unmistakable voice called out, and the crowd shoved aside to let Marquis approach. Steve slowly put down the guitar. Way to talk. While the crowd stared confused and bewildered, the two of them left the circle, walked away, and disappeared in the forest. Someone else want to give us a tune? There was no need to stay now, and Anton went to the river. Veronica and Diana lounged reps in swimming, sitting at the verge, very edge of the water. Hey, Anton! You think you'll try jumping the fire? Dapped. Oh, well, that's a shame. It's not that bad, to be honest. By had it going so high last year, it scorched the branches of the trees either side. And people still jumped over it. Sure, no one died or anything. Speaking of which, I'm freezing. Diana? Diana? Let's give it a go! But Diana gave no answer. She turned her head and her face was a mask of fear. While thinking, Anton followed her gaze. Diana? Veronica called out. What are we looking at? Anton said. He wasn't sure if he'd really seen anything. Something was moving between the trees, but was that simply the wind or a living being? He glanced back at the two women. Both of them were staring at the forest. Now, each other transfixed. Veronica's eyes had gone wide. Okay, do you, what do you see there? All right, I need to, I need to change my point of view because the screen is a little higher than my, well, point of view, basically. I, I should still get the desk uh, customized in a better way and lower the shelf with the screens. But, you know, thinking how I have to And set it up to set it up uh, sounds like a pain. Anyway. Oh no! Oh no, what? She said, and her voice no longer sounded as if it was her own. Nika, what is that? There was a scream. Someone gave an oh, right next to Anton, another of the guests, backing away, nearly knocked him over. And suddenly Anton could see it too. See what? See what, God damn it! We need to talk. The crowd fell silent. Steve took a deep breath. His heart was pounding violently in his chest. Whatever this was, it had to be part of Albert, probably nothing good. Steve put down the guitar and followed Mark away from the riverbank. They came to the edge of the forest, where the cold billowed over them like long, frigid sighs. It was so dark in the trees, Steve could barely see. Hardly anything of Mark's expression was visible when he said, I had a call from the village down the river. I found a body. Who's? Siva, feeling close and stupid, realizing he already knew the answer. Nastya, Nastya, Charam Kovala. No. Siva protested. No, 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 no. She went home. She left us a note. Steve. His hand lay on Steve's shoulder. The fisherman pulled her out of the water this morning. I'm truly sorry. It's not. Siva began. And his eyes filled with tears. No, Nancy, there was a note. I'm sorry. Mark repeated softly. They stood there, both trembling in the cold. Steve Ard as he couldn't face returned to the party. How could he possibly break news or keep it to himself? And then all of a sudden they heard the screams. Both men ran back the way they'd come without a word. The party was in turmoil. People were fleeing in all directions. Some were trying to get away from the water and then ghost. While others hadn't grasped the nature of the threat and were just trying to avoid being trampled. Huh? What's going on? Siva cried, hoping someone might give him an answer. Faceless. What? Mark breathed. Siva looked up towards the forest. They were right there, dark figures with burning eyes, alienating and incomprehensible. Siva stood rooted to the spot. He never really believed, even after Tanner had told him it was all true, even after Green confessed he'd seen the things, and even after a year ago, 
when those students from the campus had died and nobody could explain how he wasn't being stubborn mind. He just feared what would happen to his fragile psyche if he accepted it. But now he didn't have a choice. Huh, the shoreline was almost deserted. Siva knew he ought to run, but his legs didn't seem to be under his control. Get back to the campus! Mark called out, then suddenly Vanish disappeared into the thin air, leaving a wisp of smoke behind that dissipated a moment later. So that's how he does it, Steve thought instantly. Walks in the shadow, or well, not walks, warps, would fit better, I guess. His feet still seem to have been nailed to the floor. There is no floor for The ground. The others were heading for the forest, Taro, Alex, or Nika all warping in the shadow. Why were they just running away? How come they were all leaving him? Abruptly it was as if. He'd fall into a vast body of water. The cold was still there, but somehow it no longer bothered him. The light from the fire had simply gone. Everywhere was darkness and static, like the interference of an old television set. Siva screwed his eyes tight shut and tried to dispel the illusion, but when he opened them, nothing had changed. He could still hear the river, but the rushing water seemed to be far off in the stars rather than just a few steps. The the faceless had drawn much closer by this point. She wanted to scream, but he hadn't the breath left in his lungs. He turned to run, but they crept up behind him too. Ooh. It came to him that he was stuck in the middle of an ever decreasing circle. Only all at once it didn't seem to matter. Siva took a breath, inhaling the shadow deep into his chest. It was ugly and thin, like cigarette smoke. Nothing to be scared of. Not in the slightest. Steve! Taro's voice, low and deserted, trembled painfully in his ears. He tore through the shadow. The faceless broke apart and fled, almost melting from sight. Siva could see her. She was holding an ancient lantern, the light from which seemed to return the color to everything it touched. The faceless didn't like that at all. Steve noticed. He watched them flying away. Tara. Her eyes were deeper than the darkness. There were none more black. I'll get you out of here! What? He gasped for air, unable to form the question. Tara drew closer. Steve stepped back and lost his footing. Just one step, but he seemed to tumble into a deep hole, flying to the left so far and so fast he lost sight of Tara and the Faceless. There was nothing around him but the shadow. He was surrounded by it, saturated with it, choking on it, droning. No, not droning. I know how to swim. He told himself and began to move his arms. There was barely any need for that. The current of the shadow carried him alone. It was more than just a substance. It was life. Sio could feel it, breathing in and out. I know how to swim. But really, he didn't even have to keep his eyes open, so he shut them. There wasn't any need to inhale or exhale, so he stopped. From a very long way of another world, another universe, he heard a woman's voice repeating a single word over and over again. Perhaps it was an echo. Stiva. Someone was expecting him. Time to go, he thought. He wanted to head off, but something barred his way, as if he was swinging up from the depths. Thanks. There was pain and it has called Steve opened his eyes. The first thing he saw was the sky. It took him a few minutes to remember how to breathe properly and longer to get to his feet. He'd been lying flat out in the snow. The words lay around him in all directions, wherever he looked. And they died. It was late at night just a little while ago. What time is it now? Where was he? The cold began to settle into his bones, like a literal winter coat. How much time did he have before he simply froze? Steve folded his arms across his chest in a futile attempt to keep some warmth in his core and started walking better than that. Uh, that's then standing still and freezing to death. Tara tried to rescue him, but she'd failed. Where was he now? Where was she now? Had she escaped the faceless? What happened to everyone else who worked in the shadow? Mark, Veronica, Alex? And what was wrong with Tara's eyes? Step by step he plodded onwards, but nothing changed. There was just the forest, the snow melting underfoot, the frigid air and the clouds of steam as he breathed out. He guessed an hour had passed, another, maybe a third. Two lights fell around him and they didn't draw on. Soon it would be, uh, would be dark and then he supposed that would be dead. One more step and Siva knew that was his last. 
His legs gave out beneath him. He fell on his face, his mouth full of snow. He had a sudden urge to drift off to sleep. He fought it as hard as he could. After all, this was probably the end. He crawled over to a nearby tree. What's that green thing on the tree here? And sat with his back to the trunk. Siva had never wanted to die. With his face planted in the dirt, better if he could stare death in the face, at least. Well, not full in the face, his eyes were closing, then somehow he no longer had the strength to keep them open. Steve! And suddenly he found the strength after all. Was this real, or was he dreaming? Thank God! Mark breathed. It's been ha uh, I've been searching for almost a day, and I thought we lost you. Thank God! Come on! St what the hell is written here? 7th of July? The bell gave a shrill ring. The warm static of envelope Steva, invigorating him. Taro caught sight of him from her shrouded corner, leapt out and rushed towards him, then froze a step away. You're alive! Steva saw the lines where the tears had dragged down her face. They'd given him up for that, and now he'd risen again. I'd go down that easily, or something like that. He tried to sound cold dead, but after trudging through the cold for so long, he practically lost his voice. I told you I'd find him. Mark said and clapped Tara on her back. He shouted to the barman. I can't love tea if you please and make it strong. Come on, you need to warm yourself up. They took his coat, which was wet through, seated him at the table and wrapped him in a blanket. Then came the tea. Steve was still so cold, he had hardly any feeling in his fingers. A few minutes left after that, they brought him a basin of hot water to warm his feet. It was still difficult to believe he was actually here, let alone Taran Mark. Perhaps it was the fantasy of a dying man, a dream. If it was a dream, Steve felt he must have fallen asleep short before Mark told him about Nancy. Everything after that seemed like the most ridiculously awful flight of fancy he could possibly have imagined. So, Taro observed from behind him. You've seen the shadow then? How did it happen? It was hard to talk, even in a whisper. Lots of reasons. You fear a dead particle moment, you despair. Not everyone can do it, mind. You seem to have no trouble for. What's the date? The seventh. I told you, you've been there almost late and fell pretty deep. I shouldn't wonder. What do you see? Uh, I, I don't even remember, but what happened? But I was away. They're alive, everyone's fine, the camp was still panicking for a whole lot of people saw the faceless before we chased them off. Chased them off? It won't last. It calls them back, you know, the smell of blood. You mean Nancy? Yeah. Steve could feel the sensation return to his fingers. His hands were tingling. So, what do we do? You know what we do, what we have to do. I really don't. Steve protested. Cut out the root. Whatever's causing these problems and everything disappears. But we don't know what's causing them. Oh, I think we do. I'll settle this. There's still time. He rose from his seat, met Taro's gaze for a brief moment, and started towards the door. I had no idea what you settle this. Settle it how? The answer dawned on him in, the sa in that same moment. They thought why it was behind all of this. Cut out the root. You can't do this. Siva sprang up, wearing as forgotten and a poor smart, leaving a trail of wet footprints. Are you after the mind? He's still a human being. This is it be. The other said you never understand. Alright, come on, let's talk it over. He clapped a hand on Siva's shoulder and marched him back to the table, but then he ran him up against the wall and whispered harshly in his ear. You're not walking out of that door until this is finished. Come again? His wrist, the other man had put something around his wrist. Siva heard a soft click. <coughs> he brought his hand up and saw a bracelet on his arm. I'm sorry, truly am. But you leave me no choice. You can't be serious. Wait, Mark, wait! Wait! But Mark only turned on his heel, returned to the door and this time he left the cafe. God damn you, I said wait! The other crossed the room, threw the door open, and found he couldn't leave. Mark had almost disappeared into the distance. 
Stop! Siva screamed and threw himself at the doorway, only to bounce again off a news ball. It was undeniably something solid. He could feel it, smooth and hard, under his fingers. What the hell? Thor came up behind him, her head bowed, unwilling to meet his gaze. Nothing can do, Siva. Sit down, please. Stop fighting it. She shut the door firmly right in front of him. What, what was... What did he do? How does it work? He tried to dislodge the bracelet, but it wouldn't fit over his hand. Don't... You can't get it off! You're taking his side? Is that who you are, huh? I'm not taking anyone's side, nor is he. I saw him, Steve. Right, he's the one behind it. The only way to stop it getting worse is to get rid of him. But, but you can just... Steve slid down the wall and hugged his knees against the chest. The sheer impotent rage he felt made his chest hurt. He was trapped, powerless. Listen, Tara sat down beside him. A girl died, remember? Does that mean anything? Nothing to you? You don't want to stop it happening again? Steve said nothing, maybe she was right, but he'd deny her a thousand times if it meant condoning this. You couldn't just make your problems disappear. You couldn't get rid of somebody without due process and the rule of law. What if White was just causing this by virtue of being here? What if he had no clue? Help me. There's nothing I can do. Take it off. Can't, I swear I can't, only mother can, when it's over, then you can get rid of it, straight away. But then, of course, it would be too late. Tara suddenly dug her nails in her palms and looked away. What's wrong? Uh, I mean, what's wrong? Something just happened, I felt it. Siva clapped his hands to his head and tugged his head, another left on campus, not to mention one he could have prevented, and then, without warning, the bracelet suddenly clicked open. Siva stared at Was that it? Was it over already? He pulled the hateful thing off and flung it into a dark corner. He realized someone was pushing on the door, and where he was seeing in the way. The new Raval knocked. Sva struggled to his feet and opened the door. There in the entrance stood what? His hand raised. Red knock again. What a pleasant surprise! The man stepped past Tiva and in the cafe as he can carry in the world. But I was looking for Tara! She pressed herself up against the wall, looking as pale as corpse. I was curious what else fate might have in store for me, is he? He took another step inside. Steve attended straight to leap at him if he needed. Everyone tells me your cards are never wrong, so... Would you be so good to tell me my fortune? <laughs> End of chapter 2 To be continued, you can save your game to continue from here. Save the game? Yes? Alright, let's continue. No? Well, then cancel! Alright, so assume that bracelets that was put on Steva was some form of magic. And if they, the magic stopped working, that means the one who put them, you know, I would assume the life of that person ended. Unless there's someone who is capable of actually cancelling the magic. Alright, there are some weird creatures there, so I guess magic also might be true in this world. Anywho, that was Mert the Land of, of, of the Cold Tale, the Tale of the Cold Land. I don't remember! Exit to the menu, yes. There is not even a title over here! Anyway, that was smart. Hope you more or less enjoyed it. Hopefully, actually, uh, the next game will be a little more entertaining. For this one started to get entertaining, actually, at some point as well. The being was kind of, let's face it, boring. But later, yeah, yeah, it got interesting. Got me into it. Anywho. When Mert Chapter 3 is released, we are going to be playing it. When I get the information, actually, that it got released. So... Yeah! Tomorrow starting the new game. Other game. Bye-bye!